There's still things that affect us and it all goes back to that period. And I would just like everyone to know what happened and not to be ignorant to the situation. And hopefully, if we all know, you know, this will not repeat itself. And we will not allow it. We are the majority. And we can't follow one person's will. And black go fast strike. Yeah. yeah. And the red go fast. Go, go fast <laughs> lob. <laughs> Do you know somebody said to me, what? one of your carers has broke a wall what? where we Is live. It? And Is I went, it? no, it wasn't no. our carers. Turn this way. And then the other day I went out and I went, Ellie, oh, what did you hit that was red? And she went, oh, a wall outside of oh, the house. Crash. It was a <sighs> terrible job. Yeah. Um. I'd like to tell you how I got here. Um, when I was eight years old, um, we left Chile. Um, in Chile, there was a, a, a military coup happening um, where Pinochet had taken over the country, had um, possibly murdered the president. Um, and was persecuting anybody who did not believe um, in him, basically. Anybody who had any views, any opinions, they were persecuted and killed or they disappeared. I remember when I was little going um, into town as such on the bus and obviously as a child an inquisitive child, you'd ask questions. And I wanted to know why the building was all in rubbles. That was the, the, uh, what's it called? It was the home of the prime minister. It was the, the, the government thing in Chile. Um, and that was actually bombed on the 11th of September, uh, the day that they killed Allende. Um, and the answer I got was, shush, you can't talk about that. Um, it was a public place, anybody could hear. Um, and that's when people started developing the, the culture of walls have eyes, walls have ears. Um, you can't just speak because you don't know who's listening. You had no rights. As a human being, you had no rights. You existed, but that was it. Your rights ended there. My, my father was um, a communist and um, they were basically persecuted for their beliefs. Um, and we had to flee um, the country. Um, we had the military come to the house on, I think it was one or two occasions, and they ransacked the place looking for, for weapons and anything that would show that we were some sort of threat um, to the government. So my mum and, and, uh, and us went off to Argentina where we were illegal. Um, we went to to live in a in a slum where basically we had at, at the beginning we, we lived with my nan and my uncle who had also fleed because of their political beliefs um, and then we we bought our own little house um, it was at the top of a hill it was made from um, cardboard, some sort of compressed cardboard covered in tar. Um, and we used to have two rooms, one where we slept, a couple of bunk beds and stuff, and the other one where we cooked. And our, our cooker was basically a fire on in the middle of the room. Um, 
and we used to balance the pots on there and, and cook dinner. My mum had to go out to work to make ends meet. Um, my sister would look after us because we were all quite small. And me and my brother used to work too. At the age of eight, I used to walk the streets of the slum selling paraffin so that I could help my mum feed everybody. About about 50 feet from the house was a rubbish tip. Well, we used to play, that was our playground. Um, and we also found bodies there, um, burnt bodies. Um, I didn't know at the time, but I do know now. At the same time, there was also a coup in Argentina and um, they used to make people disappear there. Um, they also used to throw away food. Um, they used to come in lorries and, and just tip the food out and then cover it in paraffin and set it alight. I remember as a kid, we used to wait for the, the flames to go out and then we used to we used to dig through to the bottom um, and take the food from that. Um, needless to say, when you ate it, you, you basically could taste the paraffin and everything, but, you know, it was food. Um, my most shocking experience um, was when there was, a, there was a little boy next door he was about two or three. And we were playing out on the street and there was a lorry come in. So we all ran into the garden to watch the lorry drive past. And this little boy put his head through, through the fence and it was wiped clean off by the lorry. He died instantly. instantly. Um, and I remember when he got buried, all the children took turns in carrying the coffin to the cemetery. Um, then basically life went on. Um, you have to deal with these things and just carry on. One day, um, we were at my nan's house and, um, and my dad appeared. He had managed to, he was smuggled through the border and, um, and we were a family unit once again. Um, and then we were offered um, refugee status here in England and in Canada and my father chose England and we came here. Um, when we arrived I um, found it extremely hard the fact that we didn't have a word of English um, we didn't we didn't understand um, the culture, the the ways, um, and we had to deal with racism. I consider myself British. Um, I find that me personally don't fit in back home. Uh, I'm too westernised. Um, also, people over there seem to think that because 
we weren't there through the coup. Um, we had it easy. Um, but we didn't. Things, we may not have seen as many dead bodies as they did. We may not have um, been sheltering away from the bullets. But we've had emotional trauma. Um, which can last forever. Um, people think, oh yes, they've gone abroad, they've started a new life, it's not going to affect their future, it's not going to affect their children. It does. Um, my niece's father, he's schizophrenic and um, even though he's on medication and everything else, um, he's still suffering from the effects of the military coup. My mother um, has got Parkinson's and she's got dementia, which she won't admit to. Um, and she feels persecuted. She thinks that they're CIA and the dinner and all them people are still after her. She feels that um, they're trying to kill her. It should have been that it was over and that's it. You can wipe the slate clean and you can get on with your life and forget everything that's happened. But you can't. And we haven't had it easy. And it's not going to get any easier neither. No child should see a dead body. No child should have to scavenge for food. No child should look after their parents and basically watch them deteriorate to a point where you think, I can't do it no more. Sometimes exile is worse. Maybe if we had been there, it would have been easier for us. We would have been able to, to deal with with the things, you know, to to be able to, to move on. I feel that a lot of people in exile won't move on because they lost so much. They lost all their family. They... They lost years with them. I mean, you can go back now and, you know, the family's there and... For all them years in between, you'll never come back. And everything that you've gone through while you've been out of the country, nobody's, nobody recognises it. Nobody recognises it because you weren't there. You didn't suffer. I will never forgive the man. Not simply because of the amount of people he murdered. Um, but I see that it's his fault that I've gone through what I've been through. And the people that I love are going through what they're going through because of this man. And he got away scot-free. When, when he first was on trial, um, I wanted him to be tortured. Like everyone he tortured. I wanted him to suffer like everyone else suffered. But that's lowering ourselves to his standard. I would have liked the world to know what an evil, nasty person he was. You know, and for it to be confirmed and 
people have their loved ones returned to them or you know so that they can do a proper burial or just know what's happened to their people but that's never going to happen now as far as I'm concerned he died in a lot of people's eyes a hero when he was nothing but a coward I I'd like to ask all the viewers to look deeper to to research to make their own mind up and to see this man for what he really is Um, my name is Alicia Barros and I live in Coventry right now. I live 10 years in Chile, South America and that was born in Birmingham. Then I lived in London. That's when I went to Chile and now I'm here in Coventry. <laughs> my father came to the UK. I believe as a refugee, but I don't really know. Um, all I know is that he was running away from his country, Chile, um, because of the situation in the country at the time. It was hard to live there because um, there were things like, I know all this by asking people, but things like there would be a curfew in time, I believe it was 10 o'clock, so after that time, no one could be in the streets. And uh, the military service plus the police had permission to shoot anyone that was in the road. Um, the Why? What, what did they say, you know, to validate this? I don't know. But they had the right to shoot if someone was out there. You know, I can just speak by what I've seen and heard from my family. And I remember actually a, a horrible, horrible torture that happened to a neighbour of my uncle at the time now, in Talca again, Santiago, uh, Talca, Chile. Um, the military service came to to the house because they I don't know if the man was involved or wasn't, but the thing is that they thought he was, and he had a, ch a son. He the son was like seven years old, years old at the time, and his wife. And uh, they had dogs to sniff. I don't know to make it worse, bite people, you know, just to make it awful. And uh, they would, um, they would, they they grab the man and the boy and they put them to the side on the floor and they, they took the military service, put the man and the boy to a side and they, the military, the military people just make the, they took all the clothes off the woman and put her like in four feet and these dogs were trained to rape the woman and they would help the dog and push it so it could actually penetrate the woman and the worst thing about it all is that they would make sure that the father and the son was watching and the son was watching and the lady would just look somewhere else in shame and the son was crying and if the man even tried to do something he knew that his son would be killed and his wife so he had to watch and just shut up. And that matrimony finally split up because I suppose it was hard to live with this after. The wife might have been angry, but she understood why the husband didn't do anything. The son, <clears throat> I never spoke to him. I've seen him, 
but I've never spoken to him. So you can just imagine what what happened with him. And the man, of course, Chile is like all Latin American country, a machista country. And the fact that he couldn't defend his family, he had to stare and just shut up, gets to him, you know, his pride. So I know they they just all, the woman just sort of continued and was strong. The boy is a man now. He's like my mother's age. And um, I, as I said, I never got a chance to talk to him. I, was, I didn't know what to ask, what to say. What do you say to something like this? What do, do you ask? And uh, I know the father is like, he just crumbled. He couldn't. When I saw him and I knew who he was, he was just a guy that drinks in the corner that would beg sometimes. And he would live with his mum, who was a very elderly lady. And he just, he just gave in with life. And I think that is the worst case that I have heard. And I have seen the people, you know, and I spoke to the lady and she did, she just mentioned it very briefly and of course I don't want to go into detail, but she did confirm that there were dogs and sexual acts and that uh, her son had to see. She never had any more children. It, that's how it finished. But I don't know if they're alive still, you know, but that was awful for them. And I suppose they weren't the only ones. But the fact that they trained dogs and it was, it was like boys with uh, guns, you know? And they would be let off to go on, like, play and find out how we can make people suffer more. The military service had the, 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 the right to come in, sit down, have a cup of tea, and you had to serve them. And that's it. You know, if they wanted to, they'd just budge in. But this cup of tea, was, it was always information they were looking for. And they would try and find information. And you had to bite your tongue, not throw them out of your house because you would get done for. Now, they would always ask for a name to anyone, randomly. Or what, what happened a lot as well was like, for example, grudges between neighbours. You know, she didn't lend me sugar. I'm going to go and talk to them. And they would go to the police station, local police station, where they were all um, based and uh, just say like a name, a house number, and they would be there, they would go. And uh, the thing is that they would ask for names, you know, who do you work with? Who's this and that? It, imagine someone coming in, you haven't got a clue what they're talking about, but they want a name. They want a name now, or your son is dead. Your children are dead, we're all drinking tea. You can see the guns. You're shivering, trying not, I mean, even if you weren't guilty, you would be scared and nervous which would make them think you're guilty of something, which you're not. So imagine sitting there, having a cup of tea. These people come in, they have guns. You know, the gun is actually stroking your son's shoulder. They want a name. They're looking at you. You know, if you don't give them a name, your son might be dead. You might be dead. You don't want your son to see this. You know, you're scared. What do you do? You give a name. You give a name of them. The worst fucker you can think of in town. The, th the person you think you know deserves to get maybe a scare. But you know he might get killed. But it's them or your family. So what do you do? You give a name. And everyone was involved, you know. Everyone has their guilt because of this. So in a way, not everyone was a victim. Because they made them be part of it as well. I mean... I know only one person has actually told me, you know, a neighbour from, from there, that he gave a name of this guy. And until this day, this guy, they don't know where he is. The family's still there, the children. And the family knows that this guy gave his name. And they hate him dearly, and everyone knows it. But it's done and dusted, and he feels like shit. And he feels awful, and he feels guilty. He's been able to cope. I mean, someone could have suicide with that guilt. But he's just got on. And he just puts his head down every time he sees this lady. And the, the people, you know, the children are now men. But I know he was the only one that said it. I know that many people must have done it. But who's going to tell? Who, who would tell something like this? Not something to be proud of.
My brother and I, my brother plays a guitar and we met, we admire a lot Victor Hara. Victor Hara was a composer and uh, singer and he played the guitar. And his way of uh, coming across, and he was a revolutionary in my eyes, he would argue through songs what was going on. They found him with many others. They did like a massacre of people one day. I can't remember the date, to be honest. And it was in El Estadio Nacional, which is our pride of architecture. It's a national stadium. It's a massive football stadium where, until this day, they do concerts, major concerts and stuff like this. And the thing is that there, they had, they had like at least 500 people, most likely people they took from their homes and, you know, people they just thought had something to do with it. Victor Hara was one of them and um, he, would pl he had his guitar and the military said to him, play your guitar then. And he played his song, all of his songs that thought would get to them. He knew he was going to die. And, and they said, oh, yeah, you think you're so cool? So they grabbed his hands and they cut his fingers up to the, there. They cut each one of them. And, of course, he was bleeding to death. They cut all of them, both hands. And then they left him there and he tried not to shout, you know, being brave and not giving them the satisfaction. And then they said to him in Spanish, Si eres tan choro, ahora juega. Ahora toca por weón. And that means if you're so brave, you know, you think you're so, you know, big stuff, now play then. Come on, show us, you fucker. And they, he went and he just looked into their eyes, grabbed the guitar and played with blood and the agony and he just played his fucking song. And he played and he played until bang, bang, he was dead. But he played looking into their eyes because he knew he was going to die. But he played. And he was buried. He wasn't even buried. He was just piled up with all these other people that were killed the same day in this place. It was just like a shooting time for for them. And it wasn't the only. It's only that this one is known. And they would, they'd leave them. They had like this, this the, the Estadio Nacional, the stadium, has like a basement. And they just piled corpse and corpse and just shoved it in there, you know. It was an easy place to get rid of bodies, in a way. This was found after. They found the rest of the bodies, you know. But you can't tell who's who, you know. So all these disappeared people, you know, the mo loads of them are there. But it's too late to know who it is. And, you know, some of them, they, they could find out who they were, but... Out of 500, maybe 20, and that's it. And that's where Victor Hara lies. But for all of us, he lies in our hearts and in our minds. And, you know, he's an idol. Can I have the salad, please? My grandmother, who didn't have much involvement until she arrived to England, and they would, um, she would hear stories, and she did live part of the dictatorship, um, is now here in England in Coventry, in a home, in a nursing home. And every time I try to speak to her about uh, this period, she's in, she won't talk to me. And she has dementia now due to age and maybe what she went through. She has Parkinson's as well. And, uh, and in her dementia, she, we cannot open the curtains of her room because someone might be looking through the window, spying. We cannot talk freely in her house because the nurses are spies. The, the, the 
the manager of the home is the general and she's not to be trusted. So whenever we have a problem and we speak to her, she's angry. Why are we speaking to the general? And sometimes it gets really bad and she needs like uh, sedatives because there was a time she went to the hospital um, due to her, she has a pacemaker, she had to add a change. <coughs> and there was a really important general lying beside her in the other bed. And this general wanted to get kick her out and do something bad to the family. We were not allowed to go and visit her every time we would visit. There would be problems with grandma. And one day, in her mind, you know, the, the general had you know, just been telling her constantly to to get out and that she was going to grab her family. And in her fear for the general not to grab her family, she got up with her simmer frame, walked barely to her bed, lifted the simmer frame and hit this lady in the head. We were called, we had to ask for forgiveness Thank God the lady realised that grandma is obviously not well and she was okay with it. She wasn't pleased, of course. She did have bruising because although grandma isn't strong, if you lift the simmer frame and let it fall and you are sleeping, it will cause damage. And um, that's like the magnitude of, of her fear. I, I lived in Chile 10 years. I left when I was 10. And um, I came back when I was 20. What happens every 11th, regardless of it being a bank holiday or not, is that the lights are turned off. So we all know we must get candles for that day. The lights are turned off. All of a sudden, there's not really a, a set time. And it's not the government who does it. It's someone, an entity, a group finds a way of turning off the lights and it's a way of protesting. The light comes back on again about two hours later but in those two hours usually the youngsters more than anything they go out they cover their faces with scarves hoodies and they protest they fight against the police and this happens until today so on the 11th of September 2010 and 2011 and so on this will happen they'll turn off the lights and they'll cover up most people stay at home only a couple go and they fight against the police the police gets ready they put their hardware on the shields and um, their sticks they're not allowed to shoot anymore and uh, the helmets and I participated in one just for the fun of it and you go, you have stones, you have plastic bottles full with water, you'd throw it at them. It's like a mini war. And the police are up for it, they're ready. And they will catch you if they can, that's what they want. Take you in and leave you in for the night for leaving a mess. Unfortunately as well, things like your bus stop, your local bus stop, your public telephone get broken in. They just, you know, it's a time to break stuff and to be angry and to protest. But now there isn't a reason to protest. And what usually happens, what, what I don't like, is the fact that your bus stop the next day in the morning when you go to work is all broken, you know, and especially your bus stop. It's yours. You only benefit from it. Why break it? And the older people, the people that did live the dictatorship, they always argue that why? Why do we do this? There is no need and um, they, they always use the excuse, you weren't there. You weren't even born. Why do you care? And I do care because, um, you know, I see my dad every day, you know, or when I do see him. And, and yeah, I do care. I do get angry. And my children have a granddad like this. And my grandma has got dementia now and she's living this. And I can't open the curtains when I go and visit her 
because they're spies and and I I tried to explain to her this is not real anymore grandma but she won't understand and I can't talk to things and we have arguments sometimes until this day when it's been more than 10 years that and there's democracy but it's still there it's still alive and the Stefan sees it, my Stefan's my son and he's only seven. And he asks why is grandma scared? And he's too small to understand. But I do care and I am angry. And I know I'm not the only one. And I know it's not the best way to go and smash your bus stop. But it's, it's a way to show what's wrong and that we're not happy. And I will stop in a chair, died in luxury, in a really nice place. He was never hungry, he was never beaten. He was always with his family, he didn't have to go anywhere. And he died happy. And that's just life. Puro chile tu cielo azulado, que la brisa la cubre también. Y ese mar que tranquilo te baña. En el océano, en el Pacífico, en el Atlántico, el mar rojo y mar negro. Esto es casi todo lo que queda de Salvador Allende, presidente de Chile en 1970. At the age of 18 in Chile, you must do a military service for a year, and that's still in place till today. My father, um, he was 18 at the time, and he was doing his military service. And for what I know is that he, um, he was doing the military service, and his name is Jorge Arturo, that's his middle name, and we have two surnames, which is, his is Barros Lavin. And his uncle, Levin, was, um, they were just discussing that, you know, this is not right, we should stand up for this and we shouldn't allow them. So they, they were starting to get known, the surname, uh, Levin, for, you know, uh, speaking up, let's say. And unfortunately, my father was doing the military service at the time, and a Levin, with another Levin, although he was young, naive, he, had, he didn't have a clue of nothing. Uh, he was, um, they, they took him in, into a prison that's still up and, and they still use it now in Talca, Chile. I've, I've actually seen the place and, for example, some of the tortures he went through uh, that I've heard from my grandmother, who is dead now, he's, his mother, is that uh, they would um, they would have called the family everyone to say goodbye to him because he's going to be killed you know when they shoot at them and uh, so everyone would come this was a torture for the family as well and uh, the thing is that imagine having to go and say goodbye to your your son your elder son and you have small children still and everyone would go cry kiss and you know make the what well, what the most you can, you know, in the last minute or hour you have with that person. And then they would say goodbye, you know, really, really in a state. And uh, and he would go, they would tie him up, you know, tie up so, uh, something over his eyes so he couldn't see a cloth. And they would just point at them. And they would always ask questions like, if you talk, if you say names, we won't shoot you know, to try and grab some information last minute. Some of them did talk, some of them made, most of them made up something to get, you know, so they would be released. But they wouldn't, the ones that talked got killed. And some of, very few were brave and would shout something like, uh, I remember, um, I didn't hear this from my father. I heard this from his sister, my aunt. As my father told her that one of them said um, uh, something like, you won't get away with this, God will see you, you know. 
and because he was brave to say he was shot. So anyone that would say anything pretty much would die. And um, but it was it was a lie. They used these little I don't know munitions that make the noise, but don't actually kill. And they did this like at least five times. They would call the family of my father. They would say goodbye, always thinking this is the last time. They'll be really serious about it. They would take them down. There was even a priest, you know, to give the the last um, pray to them. And uh, the thing is that, so they would go through this, and then again, you know, people, men would wee their pants, and because you think you're going to die, you hear the the shooting. You know, they're pushing you around, you don't see nothing, and then they laugh. They would laugh their heads off, it was the best joke in the world. And so he went through a lot of this. And unfortunately, my father to this day, he has schizophrenia. Due to, you know, all he went through and he couldn't cope. El pasado no pasa. De nuestro tiempo vivo hay pocos textos de historia. No hay una biografía de la gente. Los archivos del poder de siguen siendo secretos. La arrogancia del vencedor continúa. El 11 de septiembre de 1973 es siempre presente. Salvador Allende amaba la vida y la vida lo amó. Con esa vida en la cabeza seguimos actuando, pensando e inventando futuro. El pasado no pasa. The other thing they did, which my mother told me and I've confirmed it with a friend. I don't know how she knew, but it's like the Chinese torture, they call it. They would have this sort of like toilet, which wasn't a toilet, but the, the, the state, it was like a little room, which is that you have enough space for a man to stand up. That is it. There was closed doors made out of wood, it's got loads of holes, and you know, it's not the best building, let's say. And um, he would stand there, naked. I don't know if he was tied up or anything, but I know he, he couldn't move much. And they would on purpose somehow have just let one drip of water fall. So you would hear tap, you know, tap. It would fall on your head constantly. You could move your head, but you do get bored, so it usually just falls on the same spot. And that's it, tap, tap. For three days at least, minimum. No food, no nothing. You would, and it's far away. So all you would hear was tap, tap. And then that drop became heavy on your head, tap. And it became painful, tap. And it would hurt every time, tap. And, um, and then when they took him out, it would just never go away, tap, tap. Everywhere, tap. You know, and, and uh, my mum met my dad here in England so that was eight ages after, and uh, when he had, when he has, he's okay now. But when he had some episodes, he could hear the drop, tap, tap. You know, he would go to the toilet, check the taps. You know, it would they were fine, no leaks. You know, the the kitchen, and um, but the tapping will be with him till he dies. I suppose. So, yeah, things like that. He, he, they released him. I don't know why, how, you know, he survived. Um, and I don't know how he got here. But I know that was the hardest period of his life and he was only 18. Do you play hard to end you? Hmm? Do you play hard to end you? Yeah. ¿Me puedo traducir a ella? ¿Lo, no. que, dije, lo que dije? Muéstrale el papel. Muéstrale el papel y ella entiende lo que está diciendo. No, en la cámara. No, ponérselo en la cámara. Estos son los pensamientos de Jorge. George's thoughts. A bit of everything. It was declared schizophrenic here in England, coming here. I mean, having to, to come here you have a good side, you know, the, he would have, you know, from his background and everything, and my grandma and granddad, they would have never been able to touch Europe, you know, they're from poor backgrounds, large families, too many children, never. But the thing is that it would be nice to come here 
as an opportunity, not running away, being pushed out of your country. So coming here was shocking as well. You know, change of language. They're coming from a total different culture. Here, for women to be, uh, you know, divorced, so easily done, uh, children using loads of, uh, I mean, women, you know, taking pills, not having children when they want, you know, being so independent, uh, working, you know, it's a total different world, uh, being able to afford things. Uh, it, it was just crazy, crazy too. It was a weird change. Oh, I remember what triggered it. It was uh, my mother had a miscarriage before me and she didn't know she was pregnant. And um, suddenly in the toilet, she dropped a, a fetus. And you could actually see it. I think it was like, it was quite small, but you could actually see inside the, the shape of the baby. And uh, it was quick and simple, but my father, uh, could, that he couldn't cope. That's when he collapsed. He, he was looking after the fetus and he kept it. And it was just him and the fetus in the room. And, you know, my mum... She, they, she's quite young. She got married at 16 with him, and he's nine years older. And that's when it all just went bad. But I suppose it was accumulation of so many hard experiences. Mi, no, mi nombre es Jorge Enrique Barro Lavín. En inglés. George. B. I. Loral O. S. How old are you? Hmm? What are you doing? Look at the camera. I was in 19... On the 8th of August. On the August. On the 8th August. 50, 50... On the 22nd August. Second eight, 1954. How did you come here? I Mi mamá y mi papá. A comprar azúcar y leche y todas esas cosas que faltaban en la casa. ¿Las colas eran largas? No, pero a veces hay gente que se colaba. ¿Y qué edad tenía? Era chiquitito, ¿no? Como 12 años. Como entero. ¿Después qué pasó? ¿Tuvo cumpleaños cuando tuvo 18? No, no, nunca tuvo un cumpleaños. Pero para la Navidad, dejaba los zapatos afuera, en la ventana, y decían que el viejito vascuero me lo dejaban. 
pero era mi madre y mi padre los que ponían los huevos, huevos duros. ¿Dónde ponían los huevos duros? Los zapatos. Dejaban un zapato en la ventana. <risa> Dicen que el, el padre, el Santa Claus, que existió, otro dice que no, que no existió. Este que, existió. que existe para los niños, ¿no? Para Forquesma. Pero yo creo que no, no existió. Es una leyenda. ¿Qué pasó para el 18, cuando tenía 18 años? Ah, 18 años. Me tocó hacer el servicio militar. Obligatorio. Uh -huh. ¿Y quería ir? ¿Mm? ¿Quería ir? No, mi padre me mandó. Porque él también lo hizo. Y cuando estuvimos en Caracatoe, ¿eh? el año pasado, estuve en Chile. Y fuimos con mi familia a un lugar de la montaña que se llama Caracatoe. En camping. Y ahí había pasado un río. Me parece que era Ancoa. Nos preguntan. Um, ¿Y cuándo fue el 11 de septiembre? ¿Qué año? De 1973. ¿Y dónde dejó la casa? Igual fue el 11 de septiembre. Y el año que a mí se me ¿Qué pasó entonces? El 11 de septiembre uh -huh. de 1973. Fue algo de Military Cup. ¿Y qué quiere decir eso? A la gente que no entiende. La Junta Militar. ¿Qué hacen ellos? Matar gente. Y hacer los desaparecidos del desierto de Atacama. Hay una película del desierto de Atacama que yo la vi que dejaron mataron a, a gente y lo enterraron ahí mismo. Y un soldado era bueno y le disparó en la mano a la mano. Aquí le disparó la mano, empezaba y se hizo el muerto. Y... Pero él le dio, porque el soldado era bueno. Ya no quiero hablar más. ¿No quiero hablar más? No. Ok. ¿Saben qué voy a más? My name is Marisol Barros Jimenez. Um, I was born here right in London. Um, I was born in Homerton Hospital and um, I have um, five brothers and sisters. So one lives in Chile at the moment, which is from my mum's side, Marcos, and my sister Caroline, who lives with me, um, and Alicia, who lives in Coventry, she's from dad's side, and Jorge as well, from dad's side. <laughs> My dad is Chris Ophenic, um, who is diagnosed by that. And obviously what I know is in Chile they tortured him. He was electrocuted. I don't 
don't really like talking about it that much because um, when he does talk about it, he pauses quite a lot. He just looks down and don't want to talk more, really. And um, Or sometimes he does. It depends what... I don't know, it depends how he is now. Um, I don't tell him anything now because, um, I don't know, me and my dad don't have a strong relationship at the moment. Um, he got ill when I was... Eight years old. Um, oh my god, it's true, man. This makes me cry. <laughs> um, well, he got ill when I was eight years old, and obviously since then, um, I never actually had that same person that I knew before that. Even now, he is a totally different person to what I met in when I was eight. He was never the same. Um, you know, he used to take me to the park and cinema, and obviously now he don't. Um, uh, even before that, when I was eight, after he got ill, he was in the hospital for quite a long time. I think he, I think it was about two thousand. He went in the hospital when in nineteen ninety eight, and I think he came out roughly about two thousand two thousand and one. He was fine then, but he weren't the same person as he was before, and he still isn't really. Um, so I think, I don't know, I don't call him dad anymore, I just call him by his name, George. Um, I just feel weird calling him as dad, to be honest now, I don't know why. You know, he recently just got ill again, and I don't know, it's just, he don't want to go, he don't want to do anything now, because, um, I don't know, it's just, he could aim himself, saying, oh, he's got, you know, a, I'm the only one who lives with him at the moment, and my mum as well, so it's me who has to put up with all, all the, you know, stuff that he does, it, and um, I think he should just make a bit more effort and everything like that to put in. Especially when it was ill. I remember telling him, I was like, come on, you know, I'm your daughter. At least do something, like try and get out of this hospital or things like that. And I did say to him, if you're not out by July, then um, I was just going to leave. I don't know where, but I was just going to move to one of my mate's house or something. Because I already told her anyway, because I just couldn't be bothered to go through it again. Um a few of my mates now, you know, has a strong bond with their dads, and obviously they don't understand what I'm, you know, what how I feel and things like that. Cause they're like, oh, how can you, you know, call your dad by your by his name and you're rude to him, you know? It's just I don't respect him anymore, to be honest. I really don't respect him, and he annoys me so much, um, which is bad, but you know, he annoys me a lot. Even when he speaks, um, I know it sounds weird, but yeah, I just, yeah, I just, I don't really love him, if you could actually say that. Which is sad, you know, but, you know, I do respect him, because obviously I do know he's my dad at the end of the day, but I'd just rather not live with him, to be quite honest. I actually preferred it when I was in hospital, because it was just, just quiet. I don't know, I don't like to explain that. But I just prefer him being out, even when he goes shopping or something, I just prefer it, because, I don't know, it's just annoying. I've got lots of ambitions, you know, I like to move out, you know, live just go somewhere else, forget about everything what happened really because it weren't nice, um, especially when when I was eight, um, my mum had a heart attack, not serious as we were, but um, I remember her heart was hurting one morning when I was going to school. I woke up because I thought my mum's not here, why is she not waking me up? And I got up, I was getting ready to school and I went to see her and um, she was just crying in bed, holding her like arm, and she's like, I don't know, my. She said to me, I think I'm suffering from a heart attack or something. I don't know because her her right arm was asleep. I'm not sure if it's the right or left. I can't remember. But her one of her arms was asleep, 
um, she couldn't get out of bed. And obviously, I was only eight, and obviously my dad was in the hospital by then, and I didn't know what to do. So I just went downstairs to my school, which is, I live in a flat, and then right downstairs there's a school, Verge Primary School, and I just went there to get help. Um, it was one of my teachers, I think his name was Paul, I remember him because he was really nice. Um, yeah, he he understand, he, I explained him to him, he came upstairs and he rang the ambulance to take my mum to the hospital. And then I was there, my mum was only in hospital for I think about two days in hospital and obviously, you know, my sister wasn't here from the one who lives with me now, Caroline, she was in Chile. Um, so they gave me an option. Obviously, my mum couldn't look after me. My dad was in hospital. So I remember they was going to put me in care, obviously, until my mum gets better and then I can... And I didn't really want to go to, you know, someone's house. Like, you know, who I didn't really know. So I just... I remember... I only remember this one phone number, which is by this girl called Tony, Tony Lay, and I rang her... And her mum came to pick me up straight away. Yeah, you're from America, okay? So now we're going to Ready? So you all buy. Yeah. He, the thing is, he was ill before. You know when. When um he was married with his first wife, which is Alicia's mum, um, my my sister, um. But then my mum said when she met my dad, he was fine. He was loving. He used to bring her flowers, chocolates, perfume, um, used to go out. Mama said he was a total normal man. She never knew about his illnesses until they got married. And, you know, my mum would like to separate from my dad and things like that. And I do understand her, but it's very hard for her to get divorced and things like that, especially now, how everything is now. Um... But yeah, if she actually had a chance, I would help her. I would do absolutely everything to divorce my dad because I want her to live happy now. Because I know she's like, she's she's just tired as well. I think that's what it is. And especially if he gets ill again, I did ask the doctor. Um, I said if he gets ill now, would he get ill again? And obviously the doctor didn't know what to say. He was just like, I don't know, yes or no. Um, I just can't be bothered to him get ill again. It's just if he does, then I just think I would just ignore him. I just live in hospital, just rotten to be honest. I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't. It's it's finished. It's done. We just gotta live with it. I assume I I get this anger from my grandmother and my father, my mother. And I have it. My brother has it. It's not major, but it's there. It's a little black spot in our heart, and uh, which is unneeded. And I don't want my children to have it. But I don't. I don't want this to be forgotten, because it's important. You know, all these people didn't die in vain. And, you know, it should never, ever happen again.